Hello everyone, you're listening to the Earful Tower Podcast. My name is Oliver G and let's not mess around. This is chapter 4 of my 2020 memoir, Paris on Air. I hope you enjoy it. I'll be back at the end with a little extra information from the present day. Enjoy! Chapter 4 New Wheels, Leaving Montague and Exploring Paris by Road 4.1 the Red Beast. I was in the office on the day of my 30th birthday when I got an unusual text from Lena. Meet me on Rue de Rambouillet at 6 pm. Come from Avenue Domenil. I'll be waiting for you. That's an odd message. That much was for sure. I looked up the address. It was in the 12th arrondissement of Paris where neither of us had any business. I couldn't figure out why she'd invited me there. Curiosity got the better of me and I started to search the area online for a clue, but I found nothing. Six o'clock was too early for a dinner date and far too late for a lunch. Could it be an activity? The area was directly beneath the Coulee Verte elevated walkway, but we'd been there and done that. It was also close to the Gare de Lyon train station. Perhaps we were going for a train ride. Secretly, I hoped we weren't leaving Paris as I'd organized a small birthday bash at the canal. Yes, we'd already partied in the chateau, but I wanted one last celebration, where the rest of my Paris friends who'd missed the castle weekend could come out too. But the one thing that bamboozled me the most about Lena's text was, why did I have to approach from one side in particular? What difference would that make? I finished work and grabbed the bike from the Vélib stands and headed south to the 12th hour this month. Getting to the street itself was a complicated trip, not to mention finding a way to approach it from the south. I had to take a wide turn all the way around the destination, find a place to park the bike, then walk, as I was told, from Avenue Dominil. The whole time, I was trying to figure out what was going on. When I approached the meeting point, Lena was standing on the corner of the road with a wicked smile on her face. I glanced around, but there was nothing there. Definitely no restaurant or shop, just kind of a small alleyway leading to what looked like a residential area. Don't take another step and close your eyes, she said as if I needed further confusion. And with that, she took my hand, led me around the corner, and said, All right, you can open your eyes now. And when I did, I was speechless, gobsmacked, dumbfounded. There in front of me, parked to the side of the cobblestone alley, was a red scooter. It was beautiful, shining like a new toy. It had a green and white racing strap along the side, radiant silver finishes on the front and back, and jet black wheels. Never ridden before, and it was mine. But I didn't understand this at the time. What? Oh, oh, what's the... What? I was honestly speechless. (laughs) It's yours. It's my gift to you. As long as you don't mind taking me around too sometimes. She said, pointing to the two helmets perched on the scooter seat. One was black and one was speckled gold. Mine's the gold glittery one, don't worry, she said, adding that she'd bought them from a Harley Davidson store near Bastille. At this point, I still thought it was a kind of gimmick, that she'd rented the scooter for the afternoon. Surely, surely she hadn't just bought me a scooter for my 30th birthday. She was about as penniless as I was. And if she did buy it, how the hell did she manage? She hardly even spoke French. How did she sort out the registration and insurance? I sorted out the registration and insurance. It's all done. She said, reading my mind again. Or maybe I was thinking out loud. It was a struggle, I can tell you that for free. Me? I was still speechless. While all this might sound perfectly normal to all you readers who've received new red scooters for their birthdays in Paris, it was actually a huge moment for me. Not only did I have zero inkling that I was about to become a scooter owner, But I'd never owned anything new like that before. I'd never had a new bicycle, never owned any kind of car, and certainly nothing like a scooter. My mind was zooming as I was trying to process what was happening. The first thing that came to my mind was... So... How does it work? Well, I don't actually know. I haven't driven it. Then, how did you get it to this alleyway? And why are we in this alleyway anyway? (laughs) Well, if I told you to meet me at the scooter shop, then you've figured out the surprise. I asked the guys to drive it down here far enough from the shop so you never guess what was happening. After all, I've come to know them pretty well by now. 
you would not imagine how much work goes into buying a scooter for someone else in Paris. I sat up on the seat, put the key in the ignition, and started her up. So what, do we just drive it away? Well, I think you should figure out how it works first. Um, how about take it up and down the alley, then let's get going. We've got to christen this thing before we get to your party. She responded, pulling a mini bottle of champagne from her handbag. What a woman. After a few spins up and down the alley, Lena jumped on the back and we headed to the Seine River to toast to a new chapter in Paris. We parked the bike by a ramp that led to the water's edge, popped the champagne, then headed on foot to the banks. And it was only about three minutes before I got my first lesson in scooter ownership. Two burly policemen pulled up at the riverbank and, even though there were scores of picnicking Parisians, made a beeline towards us. What's going on? Why us? Was the scooter stolen? Is that how she could afford it? C'est votre scooter, monsieur. One of them said to me, gesturing with his head towards the conspicuously red scooter. How did he know it was mine? What have I done wrong? Is Lena an outlaw? <laughs> oui. I responded. It's a birthday present and she gave it to me, I said, pointing to Lena and switching to English in the hopes it would throw the police off the scent. Vraiment? Really? She bought you that scooter for your birthday? How old are you? I'm 30. Today. I answered, beaming like a proud child. Where was this going? Well, let me tell you, that's an incredible gift. You are a lucky man, and that is a lovely scooter. But you cannot park it there near the emergency exit. You'll have to move it. We apologized to the officer, and we turned to head back to the scooter. The rest of the champagne could wait. But I had another thought. Officer, officer, one last question. How did you know that it was my scooter? There's hundreds of people here. Ah, yes, but you are the only ones holding helmets? Now, happy birthday, and hold on to that woman. This might sound like an exaggeration, but this is exactly how our scooter life started. The officer was charming, he spoke excellent English, and he was right to tell me to hold on to that woman, but he got one thing wrong. After they left and I started the scooter up for the second time, it was that woman who was holding on to me as we zoomed along the Seine River, across the Pont du Sully Bridge, and along the length of the Canal Saint-Martin to where my friends were waiting for us. And what better entry to your own Paris birthday party than on your brand new red scooter? I tooted the horn as we pulled up to the cheers of my friends who gathered around and took pictures. As I parked it safely around the corner, Lena and I smiled at one another. Oh, I'm sorry. I was such a lousy niece telling you that you shouldn't get a scooter. It's just that I already started the process of buying this one and I had to get you off the scent. What a woman, I thought again. I locked the bike took Lena in my arms and kissed her on the lips. A proper kiss, though, not the accidental Leon version. What a wonderful present. I can't believe you did that, I said, as we turned and headed back to our friends. One thing had just been made very clear, very quickly. That vehicle was about to add a whole new dimension to our life in Paris, and far beyond. Indeed, it would be this little scooter, the Red Beast, that would take us 4,000 kilometers around the entirety of France for our honeymoon. We didn't know this at the time, of course. Why, we weren't even engaged yet. But the arrival of the Red Scooter was about to change our lives, and there was an unmistakable tingle of excitement in the Paris air. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. I like that chapter. Not just because I come out as a hero. You do come. You know, <laughs> some, some have said you're the true hero of this book. Oh, point. wow. All right, then. For those who have the... Which people have said that? <laughs> I'll send you their emails. <laughs> there are some... Uh, for the people who have the book, there's a picture of me pouring the champagne onto the scooter tile. Yeah, that's right. Do you remember, I remember that? Yeah, I remember. I, I wanted to... I kind of, you know how on ships that you smash the champagne yeah. bottle to christen it. Yeah, yeah. I kind of wanted you to do the same thing, but yeah, we would have gotten more trouble. Not probably such a good idea. So like, weird, oh, weird story from today. Uh, literally today, I was doing lockdown deliveries mm -hmm. of this very book around Paris. I went past the, the Dominil. I went past the actual alleyway. Oh really? Yeah. Did you take a photo? 
No, because as I went past, I thought of it, and I'm a little bit afraid of the police. Yeah. Uh, already. Yeah. <laughs> something that something Maybe that this on. was the beginning. Um, you know. I want to know. I just want to ask you a little question about getting that scooter. All right. Was talk, talk me through the. It's dif- not stolen, I promise. <laughs> talk me about the difficulty of buying a scooter for someone else. Oh wow! It it was that process took months, and I did not really speak French, and it was super interesting. So I just decided that I wanted to give you a scooter. I had, I was, yeah, as you wrote, I was totally penniless, but I also did like little odd jobs on the side. So I, I just finished a wedding dress, a custom made wedding dress for, for someone. And I took that payment and I was like, this will be what I can pay for the scooter. Wow. So I, literally it was like a trade. <laughs> it was great. And so I started looking online. I even spoke to Fabian first. And Fabian from Brittany, you mean? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Did and he help? He, yeah. I mean, he he did, but he didn't in the end because I just decided to do it by myself. First, I looked for um, a secondhand one and just to see if that, but I, see if that worked because I figured they would be cheaper. Yeah. And yeah, surely I can't afford a new one because I saw a new. Like the price of new ones, or like those Vespas are super expensive. They're so expensive, yeah. and I was like, "Oh, I really want to do this. This is the best idea. I don't, I don't, I don't want to do another idea." And yeah. um, because it's been crossword books up until then. <laughs> beautiful one <laughs> with little pictures of red Vespas. <laughs> And so, yeah, I just, I did so much research and then I found this little scooter shop in Bastille mm-hmm. area and the rest is history. Yeah. But it yeah. was, as I remember you, like the, no surprises, but the paperwork and stuff was oh, difficult. Oh gosh. Yes. Yeah. It was so much. That's why it was. And sh- the, the lads, yeah. les gars, yeah. they were, we were like best friends at the end of it and they knew me and they, they actually knew you. Yeah, I know. Cause when yeah. I went in once to service it. And they, uh, they're like, oh, where's your wife? <laughs> I was like, lads, it's me, you know? Yeah. We can handle like, we this. don't care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that oh, was yeah. great. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was such a thrill and. And a game changer, as we're about to see yeah. in the rest of this book. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Chapter alert. eight. Oh, yeah. And the other funny thing is to think that our first scooter ride was down in Nice <laughs> with your parents and my sister. Yes, I know. Because I, I, well, I really wanted to test, like, you to test the uh, the scooter idea and to see if you even liked it, if you, like, felt comfortable riding one. So we decided to test it and rent some. And then you just got, like, in, you fell in love. I did. I kept talking about it. I yes. Remember. And I was like, okay, this is cool. This is really cool. Okay, great. I'm definitely on the right track here. And then you got so infatuated that you just, you were like, I have to have one. Mm. I just, I cannot not have one in Paris. And I was like, cool, cool, cool. All right, great. <laughs> How about you wait a little? And then, yeah, my parents, they tried to help me out as well. And in case you didn't pick it, that was the actual voices of Lena's parents. <laughs> yes. Trying to put me off the scent. Yeah, it was something like that. It sounded something like that Absolutely at the time. Absolutely nay. Absolutely nay. So funny. <laughs> Well, mm. um, yeah, it was cool. It's a really good way to... But you didn't them. expect anything, did oh, you? Oh, no way. Even in Nice, no. when we were being oh, so no weird. No, no. I yeah. just thought you were a weird Swedish family. Yeah, it was. It was. It felt really weird because, like, we love doing that thing as a family as well. Scooting like, in the Mediterranean. Yes, yeah. it's not the first time it's at so all. It's so European. Yeah. yeah. Well, we love it. My mom loves it and dad. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's great. So, it, it felt weird for them to be so, like, boring about it. <laughs> But it was great. Well, you tricked me. The end result yeah. was a success, I'd say. And uh, yes, more of the scooter, especially in the coming chapters, but also the honeymoon. Mm. Maybe I'll see you before then. But if not, I'm, I guess I'll see you for the wedding scene as well. I guess so. Yeah, okay. I'm a part of it. <laughs> well, you're, you're in there. Yeah? Okay. Right, I'll see you then. All right. See ya. A car red. While the red scooter quickly became a major character in my Paris life, it was actually a red car that got me interested in learning French. I was 11 years old, living in a small town on the east coast of Australia, and my older brother Tom was telling me about his first lesson in French. 
Hey all, I just found out something really interesting in French today. Did you know that in English we say a red car, but in French they say a car red? It's pretty cool, isn't it? In other words, they put the adjective after the noun rather than the other way around as we do in English. I suppose I'd heard French words and maybe even learned a few of them before this conversation with my brother. But the concept that grammar could be so fundamentally different in other languages exploded my 11-year-old mind. I was fascinated. Now, I'd long been a fan of the English language. A huge fan, even. I can clearly remember surprising my teacher when I was about six years old during a lesson on apostrophes. The teacher wrote its with an apostrophe between the T and the S on the chalkboard, then explained that it was short for it is, and then she moved on. But what? She didn't add the obvious, that it was also short for it has, as in, it's been a long time. I made sure to tell her, and she looked at me strangely as if to say, what kind of six-year-old cares about this stuff? And she frowned and added, it has, to the board as well. She probably thought I was an annoying little ragamuffin, but that's just how my mind worked. Anyway, the point is that still, to this day, I'm a word nerd. Language is probably my favorite topic. I love that there's a word for the little dot on the top of the letter I. It's called a tittle. I wonder if the dot on the letter J is also called a tittle. As I'm saying this now, I wonder if the word tittle could be a verb too. So just as you can say, don't forget to dot your I's and cross your T's, could you say, be sure to tittle your I's? The sad shame is that most people don't care about the oddities of language more than about a minute's worth at a time. In fact, I'm probably dangerously close to losing you right now. In any case, back when I was working at the news site in Sweden, I developed a reputation for writing columns about the Swedish language, and I was happy to write similar stories about French when I joined the team in Paris. For example, I wrote a whole article about the superbly versatile swear word putain, another about the importance of the word bonjour. I wrote about curious phrases, expressions, idioms, and sounds, and I was delighted to learn that some French people, especially women, would take a sharp inward breath when saying the word yes, almost exactly like they did in northern Sweden. But my favorite language curiosity of all is the untranslatable word. And before we go any further, let me explain my definition of untranslatable so we're all on the same page. An untranslatable word is a foreign word that doesn't have a single word equivalent in English. Chatelaine is a good example, where the best and shortest translation would be a woman who runs a castle. How can you fit that into one English word? Impossible. There are loads of great words in French that I consider to be untranslatable. For example, in France, people tend to take their summer holidays in July or August. Lengthy, month-long holidays. If you take them in July, or as the French people call it, juillet, then you're a juilletiste, while those who holiday in August are aussien. Now, imagine that you can say that singular word, juilletiste, to a French person, and they'd understand you. In English, you'd have to say, a person who holidays in July, but even then, you're not capturing it. It's more, a person who holidays in July rather than August. And if you think about it, even that doesn't explain it for someone in the Southern Hemisphere, where July and August are winter months. In France, you can call someone a juilletist. In Australia, you'd have to say, she takes July off for her summer holiday rather than August. I suppose why I love these little quirks is because they also teach you about the culture that comes with the language. The example I've just used shows that the French take long holidays in the summer, and that the idea is so popular that they have names for which part of the season you holiday in. When you boil it down, you realize that the French take their summer holidays seriously. Anyway, collecting untranslatable words is one of my favorite things to do. And they're not always charming little insights into a country's vacationing habits. The French also have a single word for cutting someone's throat, igorgi, and also for throwing someone out a window, défenestrie. Another favorite I have, which is pretty difficult to explain if you don't know French, is the verb tutoyer, to be less formal with someone. To understand this, though, you have to know that in France there are two ways to say the word you. There's the formal version, vous, that you'd use with older people or strangers. Then there's the less formal version, tu, which you'd use with friends, children, animals. So the verb tutoyer more specifically means to use the tu form. I love this word, tutoyer. 
It's absolutely untranslatable. It says a lot about French culture, and it makes no sense at all to English speakers. And the word vous voyez, which means to use the vous form, is an equally great and untranslatable word. But maybe we should leave it there before it gets too confusing. All this is to say that the French language is a rich thing, and for me, it was never more beautiful than the day a senior architect told me I could tutoyer her almost two years after I'd started working in the building. I didn't have to say vous any longer. I could finally say tu. There was a rush of emotions, a feeling of pure acceptance, equality, friendship even. I wonder if there's a word to describe the pleasure that comes with social formalities being swept away. But who cares if there's not? It was a lovely feeling to be considered as an equal with one of the older architects. I felt warm and welcome, perhaps for the first time in that office. To this day I'm not sure, but I think the architect chose to accept me because she also rode a scooter around Paris and felt that deep down we weren't so different after all. 4.3 A whole new Paris They say Paris is a city best discovered on foot, but they, whoever they are, have obviously never discovered Paris on scooter. It was amazing how much having that vehicle changed our lives in Paris. Overnight, the city became more manageable. Montmartre was a 15-minute ride away. I could get to work in 10 minutes. The thought of crossing the river to explore the left bank didn't seem like a day trip anymore. We could head to the city's big parks, the Bois de Vincennes and the Bois de Boulogne, without spending half the day on travelling. We made excursions to places we'd never considered visiting before, like the Parc des Sous, with its explosions of cherry blossoms, and the affluent suburb of saint germain en laye And what's best? We could park wherever we wanted. Well, that last bit wasn't strictly true. I've had it towed away twice for questionable parking efforts, but I've heard that's a pretty low score for a Parisian scooter. A French friend of mine put it this way, Riding a scooter in Paris comes with a 120 euro annual parking permit. While it's technically free to park in most places, you're pretty much guaranteed to get it towed every six months with a 60 euro pickup fee each time. By my calculations, that was still wildly cheaper than an annual car park in a cramped city like Paris. But the unexpected pleasure that came with a scooter was the act of driving in Paris. Sure, it was nice to be able to get to go to distant places and park for only 120 euros a year, it was a treat to sleep in a few extra minutes on work days too, but nothing compared to the feeling of seeing Paris from the middle of the roads. Surprisingly, it was right up there with riding through the French Riviera in a storm. You see, when you cycle in Paris, you're typically hugging the curb, hoping not to get hit by a bus and trying to avoid wayward pedestrians. When you're driving a car or a truck, you're forever bogged down by the traffic. But when you're on a scooter, you become king of the road. The other motorists respect you for a reason I've never really understood. I sometimes wonder if it's because they feel guilty to be driving a big empty car while we're on little scooters. Maybe it's because they're terrified of knocking a scooterist off their bike. Who knows? But the best bit is peeling away from the masses when the traffic light turns green. A scooter is much lighter than a car, so it can take off much, much faster. So when there was traffic at a red light, I could easily scoot up between all the stationary cars to the front. The motorists are usually excellent at leaving a lane between them, for us bikers. And once at the front, when that light goes green, and when I've got a beautiful boulevard in front of me, there's no place I'd rather be. Funnily enough, the scooter revealed itself to be a real head-turner on the streets of Paris too. Most of the city's scooters are nondescript, forgettable, and ugly, but not mine. Mine stood out like a gleaming little fire engine in a sea of black. Other scooterists would often turn to me at a red light and ask me where I got it from, or how much it cost, or they'd just say that it was beautiful. Once, an elderly lady crossing the road in front of me turned and suggested I should work for the local fire station with colours so bright. And often, when I parked it outside a cafe or restaurant, I'd watch people take photos of it, sometimes climbing aboard for the opportunity. But the driving was the best bit. And if you'd like a tip for an enjoyable ride, I'd point you in the direction of the big boulevards like Sebastopol on the right bank, where you can get from one end to the other, catching every light the minute it turns green. The absolute best scooter drive in Paris, without a doubt, is the Quai des Grands Augustins on the left bank, which runs west along the riverside and past all the famous monuments. If you ever have the chance, 
rent a scooter and drive it from Notre Dame to the Eiffel Tower and you'll see what I mean. Four point four, finding our feet. There was something beautiful about getting to know Paris together with Lena, another foreigner in Paris. I often thought about this actually because a fair few of my foreigner friends had come to Paris for a French person. That French person could not only help them navigate the minefields of administration, but could also point out the best milk to buy, the best restaurants, the streets to avoid, and everything from metro etiquette to language lessons. I had none of these luxuries, and neither did Lena. We were two foreigners in Paris. We were lost at sea, but we were lost together. If you can imagine the romanticism of a weekend away with a loved one in Paris, exploring, taking wrong turns, laughing in strange restaurants, that had been us for almost two years, and we loved it. Making mistakes was one of the great pleasures of coming to understand Paris, and it's something I'd encourage any tourist to do too. But don't get me wrong; it's also hard. It takes time to learn the things we took for granted back home, like knowing which brand of yogurt was best, or which telephone company had an awful reputation, or where you should never walk at night. These things we learned the hard way, or at least the long way. I was also coming to appreciate the intricacies of Paris. I'd surprise myself, really. I was never a big fan of history or architecture, but life in the center of Paris changed me dramatically. I found myself devouring the information plaques that crop up all over the city. I marvelled at the dramatic stories that have changed the face of Paris over the centuries. I loved how, if you looked hard enough, you could find traces of history on the lampposts, the doors, the walls. And while Lena and I still liked our little apartment, it came with a few annoyances too. I missed having normal showers, standing up straight, and washing my hair. We had to crouch due to the slanting ceiling, while holding the shower head in one hand. Sometimes we found ourselves longing for an elevator, especially when returning from the supermarket. And what I really would have loved was a west-facing window in that bathroom or in the kitchen. That way, we would have had unspoiled views of the Eiffel Tower, which was still only visible from the communal toilet. Such a western view was impossible to even create, as the whole west-facing wall was blocked off by a huge unused chimney that ran along the building and extended high above our rooftop. If it weren't for that chimney, Our view would have been twice as impressive, but instead, it felt like half the city was hidden from view because of a chimney. It was such a shame to think of what we were missing, and strange to consider that two years ago I'd been so smitten with the rooftop view to the south. But I'm a sucker for that Eiffel Tower, and I wanted to be closer to it. What I really needed, as you'll probably agree, was a little bit of perspective. Thank you very much, and it would come in the most unexpected of ways. Chapter four point five, Paris from the top, and in this chapter, you're going to hear the voice of my neighbor Stefan. He's in the studio. Hi. You're getting used to this now, huh? Yeah, definitely. So, so this chapter now is、uh, well, Paris from the top. You guys are going to see a new side of Paris. You ready? Yeah. Let's go. Let's go to the top. <laughs> <laughs> I was reminded of the beauty of Paris in a rather surprising way one autumn morning. Lena was out of town, and I was home alone. When there was a knock at the door, what with the often impenetrable front doors to Parisian apartments, I knew that it was probably my neighbor Stefan, and I was right. Oliver, the sun is shining, the weather is magnificent. I need someone to enjoy it with. What are you doing? I was doing nothing, and I told him so. Parfait, come with me, wino. Ah, <laughs> some things never change. I'd forever be a wino to Stefan. We crossed the corridor of the seventh floor landing, and he led me to the far side of his equally small apartment. I hope you don't fear ice," he added, giving me a mischievous wink. "Ice? What tricks did Stefan have in mind? Gin and tonics on his balcony? Did he have a balcony?" Stefan launched open his window, which was the same style as my own, built into the sloping ceiling, so he had to lift it upwards. I'd never seen the view from his apartment. But because it was on the opposite side of the building, it was quite different from mine. He had an eastern-facing window, which was pretty intriguing to me. I glanced out towards the Marais and the Bastille, getting my bearings. But that was nothing compared to what was coming. When knows the time to tell me? Do you fear ice? Ice? No. Why would I fear ice? No, not ice. 
Ice, he said, pointing out the window and towards the ground. I looked down at the courtyard seven floors below, then back at Stefan, who was grinning madly, as usual. Ice? Ice? You know ice when you are high up in the heavens. Oh, heights. You mean, am I afraid of heights? That's exactly what I said, ice. <laughs> Stefan said, I laughed. It's true. The French don't care much for the letter H when speaking English, except when there's a silent H. That's exactly when they often decide to pronounce it. I've heard a few Parisians say happy hour rather than happy hour. Have you heard that, Stefan? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Have you done that before? <laughs> yeah, I have. I have, I have. <laughs> so then you said to me, Don't laugh at me, or we will switch to Francais, and it will be me who is laughing. So, do you fear heights or not? <laughs> the truth is, I'm not afraid of heights at all, or ice, incidentally. I grew up climbing trees like a jungle child. I've bungee jumped in three different continents. I've peered into the depths of the Grand Canyon and cleared snow from Swedish rooftops. But when I saw Stefan scramble through his window and out onto the sloping rooftop, I almost wet myself. Was he crazy? It was a drop of... Do you remember this? Yeah. It was a drop of seven floors. It was certain doom if he slipped. From out on the rooftop, Stefan must have sensed my fear. Yeah, it was actually really dangerous. It was yeah. really dangerous. <laughs> Don't worry. There's a chimney blocking your fall. It's not as bad as it looks. I'm ashamed to admit it, and I know my own mother will never forgive me, but I caved in to the charming Frenchman I climbed through the damn window. I didn't look down, and I followed him up the sloping roof to the top, which came to an apex of death before sloping downwards onto the other side. Stefan guided me to what he said was the best spot, the flat slab of concrete that held a dozen terracotta chimney pots in place. I climbed on top of it, and for the first time, surveyed my surroundings. I don't know if it was the fear of falling or the astonishing beauty of Paris, but when I looked around, I could hardly breathe. It was immense. I was standing in the epicenter of the city and I could see uninterrupted in every direction. Better still, there wasn't a person in sight. The sensation was extra special because I was standing on top of my own building where I'd lived for two years and I was getting a sudden new perspective on it. Sacré-Cœur was shining in resplendent white to the far north, the Eiffel Tower gleaming away to the southwest, and with just that added bit of height I could see so much further. I could see the skyscrapers in the suburbs, Notre Dame, the Pantheon, the spire of Saint-Chapelle, the roof of the opera, the looming Montparnasse Tower, and everything in between. I could also look down on my own bedroom window, which was an odd sensation in itself, and I could finally grasp just how close we were to having that uninterrupted Eiffel Tower view. The chimney blocking it was huge. I also understood just how much taller our apartment block was than the other ones around it. The buildings across much of Paris, especially in the center, were typically built to a uniform shape and size thanks to the grand redesign of the city by Baron Haussmann. Baron Haussmann. <laughs> How do you say it? Baron Haussmann. In the 19th century. They're all six or seven floors and more or less equal in height, but we were higher. Who knows why? Did you ever notice that, Stefan? Yeah, I don't know. Was... But I think, uh, yeah, maybe... The, I think our building was one of the holders in the... Yeah. In the neighborhood. I think it was. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't thinking about that at the time. I was thinking about the city, the sheer scale of it, and how fortunate it felt that I was living in the middle of it. Stefan took a great picture of me up there, standing among the chimney tops with both arms outstretched to my side. Behind me, Paris, with the spire and towers of Notre Dame visible below my right wrist, the same spire that was so tragically burned to ashes just two years later. Stefan's picture captured our little adventure perfectly. My whole body was full of energy, fear, and excitement. I was lucky to be alive, that much was for sure. But I also realized that if I wanted to stay alive, I should get off the roof. I climbed down... What did you say? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I climbed down and thanked Stefan for the invite. The experience was exhilarating, but I never went up there again. Paris is probably best enjoyed from the pavement, to be honest. But every now and again, it's nice to see it from the top. Really nice. Why did you take me up there? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I, I just wanted to kill you or something. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty crazy. Like yeah. uh, I was going through my old pictures 
uh, and looking for th- things in, in Paris adventures and stuff. Mm. And when I saw that picture, it almost uh, the hair on my neck stood up. Yeah, it was amazing. Did but you go up there a lot? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, mm. Not not that much, but um, once um, went there uh, with a, with a girl. Actually, oh yeah, so it was kind of stupid because. It was really, really dangerous. Yeah. But it was one of the best moments I'd, I'd done. Oh, wow. And yes, it was like a ma- magic moment. Yeah. It's Do you think um, our building was the oldest? I don't know if it was the oldest, but I, I definitely think it was one of the oldest. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. It was a, like the view up there was just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And for the people uh, who are reading the book, I think that there will be a picture. That exact picture that I mentioned is in the book. Oh, cool. So if you only got the audio experience, then you're just <laughs> going to have to imagine it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, thanks, Stefan, for a memorable day. Thank you. Leaving Montague Two people can live in a shoebox apartment for two years and not a day more. That's the limit. This dawned on Lena and me one morning as if it were the most natural thought in the world. We figured that it would be mad to spend another day in that tiny Chambre de Bonne, so we went looking for something bigger. And like so many Paris apartment stories I've heard, we found our perfect place by pure chance. We'd been invited to a party in the 11th arrondissement by a French drag queen we'd met somewhere along the way. The theme for the night? Dress up in drag. Well, at least make an effort. The host added that no one should make too much of an effort because she wanted to look the best, of course. And, perhaps surprisingly for a drag party, it wasn't the costumes that grabbed our attention. It was the apartment. It was breathtaking. It had an enormous living room with the original fishbone parquet floors, ceiling-high windows, and double glass doors to the bedroom. At four floors up, it was just above the tree line, and it had a charming view over the intersection of a quiet Parisian street and Rue Charonne. After sufficient compliments to the host about her dress, makeup, and wig, we asked about the apartment. How on earth did you find this place? It's amazing. Oh, this old place. You like it? But I love it too, darling. But I'm upsizing next month. If you want, I could get you ahead of the queue. We can put in a good word with the real estate agent. She's a friend of my family. And don't tell anyone I told you, but you can get this place for a steal. Lady Luck was showing her gorgeous face once more and I was ready to chase her. We said we were in. The drag queen winked one massive eyelash at me, said it would be done, then strode elegantly to the front door to greet some new arrivals. Lena and I couldn't believe our good fortune. We met the real estate agent, Madame Raymond, a few weeks later. She told us she couldn't speak a word of English, but it didn't matter. There wouldn't be any need for lengthy discussion because this was an open and shut deal. The drag queen had put in a good word for us, and all we needed to do was confirm we were happy with the place. Madame Raymond took us into the apartment and flung open the front door. And if we thought it was brilliant during the evening, we weren't prepared for the sheer impressiveness of it in full daylight. Our eyes were met with an almost blinding natural light that swept the room. Being above the trees with ceiling-high windows and an unusually low building across the road, there was nothing to stop the light from flooding into the room and reflecting off those wooden floors. It was so powerful, so beautiful that I almost had to look away. And it seemed even bigger than we remembered because the drag queen had moved out and taken the furniture. And of course, the room wasn't filled with big wigs and feather boas anymore. We inspected the rest of the apartment, almost shivering with excitement that a place like this could be so affordable. We started talking about how our lives would change once more with the move, how we could finally have guests not only for dinner, but also for the weekend. Hell, we could even get furniture. It all seemed too good to be true, just like my first place, which was starting to feel smaller and smaller by the minute. So, Madame Raymond... Show me the dotted line, I said in English. She didn't understand, and I didn't know how to say the same thing in French, so I just said that it was parfait, and that we would very much like to take it. Fantastic! I'm sure you will love it here. Now, all we need is your dossier, and the apartment is yours. 
Ah, the dossier. I'd heard about the dossier before, and I hoped never to come face to face with someone who wanted one. My current landlady had never mentioned it. I never had to take the time to make one. Essentially, the dossier is a set of documents that proves you have a stable job with enough of a regular income to cover the rent. You have to prove that those living in the home earn three times the rent each month. Now, I wasn't earning that much money, but if you added my salary to Lena's, who had just started an independent shoe company, then we could scrape through. We went home and made our first dossier, crossing our fingers that we hadn't missed any details and that Madame Raymond wasn't showing the apartment to others. We sent it off before the end of the day on Friday after translating a bunch of Lena's Swedish work documents into French for the benefit of the future landlord. The real estate agent said she'd get back to us on Monday. We spent the weekend planning the big move. For the first time, we found ourselves inspecting furniture in the flea markets, something we didn't have the luxury or the space for in the Chambre de Bon apartment. We discussed how life was set to change. I almost sent a letter to my landlady saying that I was on the way out. Luckily, I didn't. Because on Monday morning, I got the bad news from Madame Raymond. You do seem so lovely. But I'm afraid we just can't let you have the apartment without a full dossier. You both need French jobs uh, with French incomes. It's simply impossible. I'm sorry. Heartbreak. Well, the goddess of fortune is a fickle one, and I should have realized that going in. We had the money for the apartment, but not the paperwork. And we couldn't get the paperwork. The dream apartment went out the window, and we were left with two options. One... Get Lena a French job so we can have a French dossier. Two, find an apartment through someone who doesn't care about dossiers. It was only then, two years into my Parisian life, that I realized how lucky I'd been to find the Chambre de Bon apartment we were living in. I have no idea why that landlady didn't want my papers. But now, it seemed that we'd have to wait if we're going to move from our lovely little shoebox. It was definitely a kick in the shins. French administration trying to have the last laugh. But as I said before, the only way to beat French admin is to make sure you're laughing first. Even if it's a bitter, dejected, and somewhat angry laugh. And voila, there you have it. Chapter 4 of Paris on Air. Thanks for listening. Oliver here, of course, but in present day. And uh, just tuning in to say thanks for listening to that whole chapter. Thanks to Eddie for editing. He's uh, Eddie's my brother. He's put together a scroll, a guide to that very episode that you just heard involving a really deep dive into, firstly, some of those places that I talked about that I could get to on the scooter. So behind the scenes, interesting links about the Bois de Vincennes, Parc de Sceaux, Bois de Boulogne, that kind of thing. He mapped out those scooter trips I talked about and he did a couple of pages on the scooter with all the videos and content that I've done with that. So you can unlock that and help me make this show better. Patreon.com slash The Earful Tower. A few of you have been buying this audiobook, which really warmed my heart. That means that you guys, uh, it either means that you guys enjoy it and you want to um, pay for it. Or it means that you're itching to hear the rest of it. Or perhaps it means you've got a long road trip ahead of you. Let me know. I'm happy to read out something on this podcast with letters or emails from you guys at home. If you want to join them and purchase a copy of it so you can listen all in one go, just go to theearfultower.com slash shop. And that's also where you can get a paperback copy of the book or the children's book, Kylie the Crocodile. Now, I mentioned a little bit about next week on this very podcast It's going to get a little bit meta because that's where I start talking in the book about starting the podcast and explaining how it grew. There's stories of uh, the crocodile, the the original crocodile story. There's uh, the very first days of the podcast. You're going to hear it. It's going to come out next week on Monday. I'm still on parental leave and I'm enjoying it for the most part. Um, Plenty of stories that have come out of this having a little Parisian baby I can't wait to share them perhaps in another book one day before too long I'll leave it on that if you're enjoying the show tell your friends about it new subscribers uh, are always very welcome and I'll talk to you again next week with chapter 5 merci beaucoup